Good morning, everyone, or good evening to those um, in Australia at the moment. Um, just a little uh, sound check, um, just make sure uh, you can hear me. Today we'll be using the chat function um, uh, for everything. So it, just make sure you can hear me, uh, make sure your co the correct speaker is connected. Um, perfect, so everyone can hear me loud and clear. Um, so we'll get going. Uh, we still have lots of people joining, but um, we'll get going because I want to uh, try and stick to time. So thank you so much for joining this webinar. Um, I'm so excited. We've got a huge group from all over the world. Um, so it's such a pleasure to talk to you all uh, today. The webinar is going to be probably just over an hour, depending on how we go, and then I will adjust to the CPD hours accordingly. Um, I want to, I mean, I'm aiming for about an hour and 15, but if you have lots and lots of questions, um, then, then maybe we can go slightly longer, but I'm aiming for about an hour and 15. So my name's Rena. Um, I'm a specialist periodontist. I'm based in London in the UK. And today the webinar is on perio treatment for hygienists and therapists. Um, and this is, uh, I, I've organized this um, uh, webinar. So RW Perio is my clinic in London and American Eagle have joined forces with us um, with this too. So thank you to them. In terms of an overview um, of what we're going to be going through, I know it's a big group, but it'll be really good to try and make this as interactive as possible. Please use the chat function rather than the question function to type in any questions as we go along. And at each point, um, I'll stop and then we can take a couple of questions uh, and then move on. So uh, hopefully um, you'll find this um, interesting. So we're gonna start off, it's all about perio treatment, but it's not just about the treatment aspect, it's all the stuff around it as well, which is important um, for us to also go through. So we're going to be going over um, terminology, just general use uh, sort of, of words, essentially, um, communication. So um, the terms we use with our patient, how we get consent for treatment, because personally, I think it's just as important how we get consent um, as actually doing the treatment. So that's important. Um, we're going to be talking about planning treatment. So not, again, just doing the treatment. How are you going to plan it? Are you going to see your patient uh, in one visit? Are you going to see them uh, over four visits? How do you make those decisions? What about expectations? Do you know what the average improvement is for pocketing? What are, you, what are you expecting? Is it two millimeters? Is it four millimeters? What's normal? What's good? So we'll be going through expectations and then we'll be jumping into actually doing treatment. So the first thing we always do is providing LA. So we'll go over that. Then we're going to jump into talking about actual instrumentation, including hand instruments, but also the other forms of treatment that we can use as well. And then finally, we're going to finish off with a little bit about looking after ourselves, um, because hopefully we've got a long career ahead of us um, and we want to make sure we look after ourselves so we can actually practice. So we're going over that as well. All right. So let's start off with um, terminology. So I'm a little bit um, picky when it comes to terminology, um, uh, but I think it's the right way to be. Often we hear lots of things, you know, debridement, scaling, root planing. There's all these kind of different terms that people use, root surface debridement. And it's really important both in our notes um, and when we uh, actually communicate with our colleagues that we use the right terminology. And root planing is definitely quite old school now and no one really uses that. And root planing, what it actually means is that you're taking quite an aggressive approach, you're removing the cementum. And so that one's completely out. Scaling, I, I guess you could use, but really the kind of up-to-date terminology now um, is debridement and ideally root surface debridement. So that's the terms that I like to use um, with my colleagues and in my notes as well. So uh, debridement or root surface debridement is, is the right term to use. Now there's different types of debridement and often hygienists and therapists will ask me, well, Rena, what, is this actually supragingival debridement? Is it, um, what am I doing in maintenance? Am I actually doing RSD or am I just doing a supra scale? So I like to have it clearly into three different terms. So you've got supragingival debridement, which is basically everything above the gum, right? Root surface debridement is anything where you're going into a significant pocket. Now, some of you are probably who are super switched on will be saying, hold on a minute, but with supragingival debridement, what if I've got a two millimeter pocket? Is that actually root surface debridement? Is it supragingival debridement? All I'd say to that is just call it supra, right? Because it's not actually an actual pocket. So reserve the term root surface debridement for when you've actually got a deep pocket, right? And then maintenance debridement is quite a nice term to use for the patients you're seeing, you know, every three months for maintenance. 
sometimes it can get confusing if you write things like I did RSD because RSD usually is reserved for active treatment. So it's a nice, I mean, you can write it if you want to, but I quite like using the term maintenance and debridement. And that's what uh, the hygienists in our team use as the, uh, uh, when they're seeing patients or maintenance. So just a little side point, but terminology is always good to clear up um, from the beginning. Now, moving on to communication. And I think as a hygienist, as a therapist, as a periodontist, in our field, communication is one of the most important things, right? You can be an excellent clinician, like you can be absolutely a great, you know, doing amazing root surface debridement, getting every single little bacteria off if you could. But sometimes it's actually more important to be able to communicate well with your patients, um, so they feel under, they feel like they, they kind of understood what you're talking about, um, and they feel prepared into the treatment they're going into. So I thought I'd include a section on communication because when we're explaining treatment, hopefully we're also all explaining what actually is gum disease. Now you, I mean, you guys are obviously super motivated to be on this webinar and you probably all do explain to your patients what gum disease is. But when I see patients on the clinic and I was a specialist um, gum clinic, so it's all we do is, is perio. When I ask patients, once I've done the consultation and I'm explaining what's needed, do you know what gum disease is? Has the referrer explained to you what gum disease is? It's so surprising. The number of people who, who don't actually know or understand what gum disease is. Now, if you had a problem with your knee or something, right? And you had to go and have a knee operation and the surgeon didn't actually tell you what, why you needed that operation or why you needed that procedure, right? It, you wouldn't be very happy just jumping into it. So it's really important to get patient motivation, to get good consent. It's actually, I know this sounds obvious, but tell them what gum disease is. So the way I like to explain it is, right, I normally get a pen, whichever's in the pot nearest to me. So I'll say, look, this is your tooth, all right? This is your bone. So your teeth is held in place by bone. Around the bone, you have gum. Normally, the gum is nice and tight and holds everything together. In gum disease, what happens is you get bacteria, which attach to the teeth. The gums don't like it, so they start bleeding. And that's kind of the first signs of gum disease, an alarm bell that something's not quite right. Then what happens is the gum loosens up around the tooth. So you get this space forming between the tooth and gum. And that space is called a pocket. So that's a space uh, between the tooth and gum. Why that's important is once you've got this pocket that's opened up, the bacteria and the bugs are gonna go all the way down into the pocket and hit the bone. And if they hit the bone, they can start dissolving the bone away. And if they start dissolving the bone away, the teeth can get looser because there's less holding them in place. And eventually they can, the, the tooth is lost essentially. So that's your kind of basic process. And they'll think, oh gosh, I understand now what a pocket is. I understand why I need to actually uh, address this condition. And then you can go on to actually saying um, this pocket, you can have open pockets, you can have closed pockets. And that's a nice term for you to use because patients understand that. They don't understand. You can't say you've got an eight millimeter pocket. You can, but in terms of keeping it simple, open pocket, closed pocket. Open is anything that needs treatment, which we'll go through in a minute, and closed is anything that doesn't need treatment. So if you actually explain, Mrs. Smith, you've got lots of open pockets, we really need to do some treatment to actually try and close these pockets so the bacteria don't keep eating away at your bone, then that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to actually save your teeth um, so they don't become looser and you lose them eventually. So it's, it's a great way to have, have make, you know, you can use your own analogy or your own explanation, but that, I find that that kind of works quite well for our patients. Um, you can also link this in with systemic health because you can say once these pockets are open, by the way, Mr. Smith, the bacteria can go also inside your pocket and travel to your bloodstream and they can reach your heart, um, your brain, all these other things. And that's why it can have an effect on your general health as well. So, you know, you can use this explanation to expand um, what you're saying as well. Um, and the key thing is, you know, they need treatment because the end result is tooth loss if they don't have treatment. And I think, again, I know for us this is obvious, but for some patients, they might not know that this gum condition leads to tooth loss, right? If you had a problem with your knee, right? I'm sorry I keep using this knee analogy. It's the first one that came to my head. But if you had a problem with your knee and the surgeon said to you, right, we, we, you need to have this operation, you need to have this procedure, and you said, oh, I don't quite fancy that. I don't, I don't really want to be put under general anesthetic. I don't, I just, I'm really busy right now. I just don't want to have a knee operation. But if the surgeon hadn't told you, you might lose your knee because of it. You'll be a little bit annoyed if you found out a couple of months later 
from your doctor, oh, did did um did that did the, the surgeon not tell you? Didn't it lose your knee? Sorry, we've got to lose your knee, right? So for us, it's obvious gum disease, pocket, bone loss, tooth loss. But for the patient, honestly, I've had patients crying in the chair saying, Rena, I didn't know this would lead to tooth loss. If I knew, I would have done X, Y, and Z. So make it clear. And in terms of what the treatment involves, it's good to say to them, use the analogy again, you've got these pockets here. What we're trying to do with the treatment is go inside the pocket and basically disinfect, uh, disinfect it, get rid of the bacteria um, so that the pocket can close up. You need to create the right environment for it to close up. So I would say, um, I mean, now that we're at home because of COVID, it's a good time to come up with these types of explanations that you can just reel off, off your tongue. So it's very easy for you to say um, to your patient. So they're the kind of common questions that they may ask you. It might be also worth maybe um, preparing a leaflet for your patient so that every time you suggest root surface arrival or perio treatment, here you go, here's a leaflet. So you've gone over it, but you've also reinforced it with um, written uh, information as well. So consent is an important topic. Now, I'm not suggesting you all have to get written consent, but verbal consent and making a note of it in your uh, record keeping is important. So when you're gaining consent, there are a few things we need to cover. The benefits of treatment, which uh, we've gone through, um, but also the risks. Now, this is one we do need to spend time on because unfortunately with our, with our specialty that we all do, sometimes it's not as glamorous, right? As those dentists doing nice cosmetic aesthetic cases. Yes, we save teeth, but firstly, we don't get an instant change in how, well, sometimes we do, depending on the staining, we don't get a drastic change in how they look, but also sometimes they can actually look worse um, than when they first came in. And they can be uncomfortable as well for a few days or a few weeks even. So consent in terms of risks is really important. And, and I guess you can call it side effects rather than risks. Patients get upset, not when you, um, not when they uh, get these problems, it's when you haven't warned them of it. So that's really, really key. So there are four things you must, must talk about. Pain. So pain, normally it's not too bad, I say to the patient, um, and it's usually manageable with regular painkillers. Okay, so normally manageable with, with regular painkillers, um, uh, but just to warn you, there might be a little bit of soreness after we do this treatment. Sensitivity is quite common, so just reassure them. It means actually we've done a good job, means we clean everything off really well. Um, don't worry, it's short lasting and you can use a normal toothpaste that helps with sensitivity to address this. Done. Bleeding. Now, interestingly, this is uh, very important for us to know that bleeding increases before it gets better or completely stops. So you must warn your patient about this because if they realize that Mrs. Smith is now, she's had her treatment with the hygienist and she's gone home and then suddenly she's brushing her teeth, doing all the things she was meant to do, but there's like profuse bleeding, well, not profuse, there's more bleeding than there was. She'll be like, oh my God, what's this hygienist done? And actually you've done a really good job. So she might get put off because bleeding, logically a human, when it bleeds, you think, oh, I don't want to touch it. It's, it's bleeding, let's not touch it, right? So if, you like, if you're arm was bleeding and you had a cut you wouldn't keep like cleaning out would you just like, kind of put a plaster on it and just leave it so here we must say to them actually you know what it's kind of you're going to have to kind of bleed it out don't worry about the bleeding it will increase but it will slowly slowly it will get better so reassure them because the last thing you want is them not following your or hygiene instructions and then probably the most important thing especially for those patients who are kind of high aesthetic demands is recession right gum recession, black triangles, you must warn them, especially if they've got like a thin phenotype, they will get recession. So you must warn them from the beginning. And I guess as part of consent, it is important to uh, actually say to them, what are the alternate options? Well, I guess you could have no treatment, which I would not recommend actually say that no treatment, I would not recommend, or you can just try and maintain what you uh, where you are right now. Um, but unfortunately, that will mean things will get worse and you will lose teeth. So give them the options as well. So consent is really important and it's worth updating your templates um, for this. This was a patient I saw, very severe case referred by a hygienist and we did some treatment um, and this is how he looks. So in my perspective, he looks beautiful. His gums have really retracted. He's got loads of recession. From the patient's perspective, they're like, oh my God, like my gums are like shrunk. Um, I've got like all these black triangles that have opened up. I've got so much sensitivity, right? He was fine because he knew, right, that this is a sign of health. So I always say if your gums recede, that's a, I'll just reassure you, that's actually a good thing. Um, it means your, gum, your, your gums are healing. They're tightening up to health. 
But if I hadn't told him that, right, imagine this was your patient and you hadn't consented them or had a conversation with them, you would be panicked, right? Like what is happening to my mouth? And all sorts of things that, you know, they either get really upset about it, they wouldn't do their oral hygiene, et cetera, et cetera. So it's all about communication um, because what we think is good sometimes might not think what the patient is good. Um, I, because I'm, I do severe cases, so I have a written consent form. I don't think it's essential, but you might want to. Um, so uh, I'll send you, by the way, guys, I'll send you the handout of uh, these slides, and I'll also send you a recording. So please just enjoy. Don't worry about making drafts, you know, frantically making notes. But I'll, I'll send you this. But if you want to, um, you can put it into a consent form. It's completely up to you. All right, so we've talked about communication. Now we move on to actually planning our treatment. So in terms of um, indications for treatment, for root surface debridement, just to remind you, it's four millimeters with bleeding on probing, and then five millimeters and above um, that you need to do root surface debridement on. Um, and the best way of, of doing this, and this is what we do at the clinic, is we print out the pocket chart um, and we actually highlight where there's pockets. Um, this you can also give to your patient because what we do is we do that and then when we reassess them we do the same thing and then they can really compare um, how much it's improved by the highlighted areas but either way for you when you're sitting in the chair you need something because you're not going to be able to memorize everywhere where there's pockets which tells you which teeth you need to go deep right um, but the reason why I'm saying this is you can't just do RSD everywhere if you've got a pocket which is two three millimeters and you start hacking away at it with um, uh, your hand scaler you might get attachment loss so you need to you know I used to when I was at dental school I was in my perio I was doing my perio training um, in perio school I basically used to get like a piece even like a tissue and just with a biro just uh, put, put in the teeth that I need to work on just so I know in my mind where are those deep pockets so it's simple as that it doesn't need to be anything um, glamorous obviously the indication for RSD we do need to have the plant control um, at a reasonable level um, it's really difficult to say what optimal is if you read the textbooks they're going to say like less than 15% less than 10% and I'm sure you'll agree with me there's a lot of you in this room who will understand that in real life, this is so difficult, right? We should aim for that, but sometimes you have to be a little bit lenient because just getting them into the actual treatment may motivate them at the same time. I'm not suggesting we do RSD on like patients with 89% plaque. There's no point in doing that. It's a waste of your time. It's a waste of their time, but get try and get them kind of uh, going. And I mean, even if they do have a, pl a high plaque score, what you could do is a gross scale. So they just feel like you're doing something as part of the treatment. If you've got a patient who is just not, not interested, right? Mrs. Smith's just not interested. She's just too busy. You know, she's been forced um, by her dentist to see you and she's just not engaged. Then you might have to actually, um, uh, you might actually have to, to refuse doing actual active treatment. Um, if you've got a, even like a non-engaged patient, it's really useful in your notes to actually write engaged or non-engaged right? Because then that gives you an idea and the person who looks at your notes, it gives them an idea as to what type of patient are you dealing with? Are they engaged or non-engaged? And um, that's official terminology that you can use. In terms of um, plaque control, um, obviously this is really important. It is part of the treatment is what I want to emphasize. Tell the patient, don't just say I'm going to teach you how to brush your teeth. Tell them this is the first part of the treatment. If you say treatment, right? then they'll think, oh, I, I don't mind. Um, uh, I don't mind actually spending time on this. Um, if you don't say uh, it, it's treatment, then they'll just be like, oh, you know what? Why is she wasting like 20 minutes of my half an hour appointment on oral hygiene instructions? So videos are great to use, um, show them. Uh, we've got, if you, you're more than welcome to use these videos. They're on the RW Perio YouTube site. Um, these are my teeth, so don't judge, but uh, yeah, I can get yellow in there. Um, and this is the uh, single tufted. So sh single tufted, I'm sure you'll all agree as hygienists and therapists, is like the best thing ever. Um, we use it all the time. I think every perio patient should be using it. Excuse my arrested caries on the, uh, the lower six, um, but you know, show them how to use it. They're not gonna understand until you actually show them. They need to be able to feel how it should feel, right? I'm not a massive fan of models, just go straight into the mouth uh, and the oral be test drive's great as well for that. So get the plaque control um, sorted first. Then we move on to deciding when we're planning, okay, how are we gonna see this patient? 
I've got, you know, a 30 minute appointment. Um, how am I going to break this up? Am I going to see the patient in one go over a few visits, half mouth, quadrant by quadrant, full mouth? Well, quite honestly, there's no evidence to suggest that one technique is better than the other. It's usually dependent on things like severity and extent, obviously the worst, uh, the condition. Severity is how bad it is and extent is how uh, extensive it is. So um, it depends on um, uh, the severity and extent, how you break it up. It depends on how long you have um, in your appointment. Also depends on numbing up. If you've got to numb up, you might not want to numb up the whole mouth, right? Anxiety can go either way, right? So in terms of anxiety, some patients who are really, really anxious, um, they might prefer lots of short appointments. Some patients who are really, really anxious that I have, they just want to get it over and done with. So it's all about having a discussion with your patient. What about the plaque score? If they've got a really high plaque score, it's probably not sensible to see them um, in one go because you won't be able to reinforce your advice. So break up your appointments. And what about logistics? Some patients, as we know, are super busy. They might need to just get it all done in one go, right? Um, and medical factors. Now, this is interesting. This is a new thing, guys. So um, I was speaking to Ian Chappell, who's a professor in Perio, um, uh, fantastic periodontist, um, and we were talking about um, cardiovascular disease. If someone's got unstable cardiovascular disease, it's not a good idea to do RSD in one go, because remember, what we're doing is we're increasing the inflammatory load. If you increase the inflammatory load, you're increasing risks of things like, uh, um, you know, you're triggering uh, possibly cardiovascular issues. So try and break up appointments for them. So for this um, patient here, right, I just want you to have a think in your head. This is uh, uh, um, Mr. Jacobs. He's got generalized perio. This is pocket chart. Okay, just have a little look at the pocket chart. I want you to decide whether you're going to do this half mouth, quadrant by quadrant or full mouth. And these are his radiographs. So hopefully you're thinking here, I would probably go with a half mouth approach. Yeah, you might get away with full mouth, but the reason why I wouldn't do full mouth is his, his OH is not very good. So here you would do half mouth, okay? Whereas here, if you had a 30 minute appointment, this is Sarah, severe um, perio. She's only 32, This is her pocket chart. Pockets everywhere and deep pockets. So severity, she's ticked the severity box and the extent box, right? So here, and if you look at her bone level as well, she's quite susceptible for her age, I would probably do quadrant, as Maryam has said, quadrant by quadrant, okay? So yeah, then you also have to take into account the patient factors, so this may change, but I'm just giving you an idea as to how you'd make that decision. So um, in terms of, um, Sabrina, your question about changing expectations of people uh, in a 30-minute appointment, I think the key is communication, right? Communicate that OHAI is part of your treatment. They can't, you can't expect them, you can't expect them to actually uh, clean for 30 minutes. For those types of patients, it's all about communication. You just say to them, this is part of your treatment. In fact, it's more important than your treatment. It's 80% about what you do and 20% about what, what I do. If you're doing quadrant by quadrant, got a, a message just now in the chat, how long are the, the appointments? It depends on your practice protocol. It, you, some of you might have half an hour, some of you might have 20 minutes, some of you might have 45 minutes. That also will depend on whether you do quadrant by quadrant or half mouth. So it's, it's a discussion with you and the patient and how the practice setup is. So now we jump on to treatment. So the first thing you need to do is obviously um, know about local anesthetic. Now I know some people sometimes don't want to give local anesthetic and the patient doesn't want to give it. My personal opinion on this is if you're working with periodontitis, there is no way we can do a really good job unless we actually get them numb. But we need it. In the UK, currently, um, hygienists and therapists need an LA prescription. I hope this changes because it's rather annoying, to be honest. But you need to let your referring dentist know that these are the, the bits that you need to include. So perhaps, again, whilst we've got a bit more time now, make a template. Let the patients know, um, uh, sorry, let the dentist know that they need to use this template. Um, I know someone said it, prescriptions for Ireland are great, very great. Yeah, I think it's an area that they, they do need to clarify. In, the, in, the, um, in England, at least, you do need it, but I, I do hope that changes soon. Um, and also, like if you're in a practice that you're working at for a few days a week, it's a good idea to check for the next day, have all my LA prescriptions been put in. If they haven't, then rather than chasing it up patient by patient, chase it up at the beginning of the day or the end of the previous day. In terms of how valid these prescriptions are, I contacted Dental Protection um, recently and they said there's no clear guidance, but after a year, right, 
um, it, would, it would generally be a good idea to renew that prescription because things would have changed um, uh, with the patient. Um, with uh, someone's just asking about topical, um, it's, a, it's just the benzocaine for some reason that you need a um, prescription. I've, if it's a template, the thing is you don't have to write it out each time. So it's a good idea just to ch chuck it all in in terms of what's required, et cetera, et cetera. So the dentist can give you as much information as possible, but definitely for the actual LA um, and then the, the benzocaine. Um, okay, so um, in moving on now, uh, also when you're planning, you, if you're dealing with like a really severe case, a bit like the one we saw earlier, you might need to think about referring. Um, there's a perio, unfortunately, three quarters of claims in the UK are um, for, for medical legal issues are due to perio. It's one of those conditions which I'm sure you guys have seen it, right? In practice, as hygienists and therapists, you're amazing, but I'm sure you've seen previous neglect uh, or previous missed perio or untreated perio. Um, but as well as that, not referring at the appropriate time can also lead to medical legal problems as well. So offer referral uh, and the guidance is with the BSP in the, in the British Society of Perio is a BP score of four plus another risk factor or stage four grade C you need to think about um, referring. When you are saying this to your patients, you know, make it clear that this is beyond my scope now. Um, I need to try and do everything I can to um, try and save your teeth. So you're going to refer to the specialist and then I'm going to get you back and I'll be able to look after you properly. It's a bit like if you had an eye problem, I can pick that up, but I can't do the eye surgery. I need you to see the, the, the specialist for this. So um, my clinic's in London. If ever you guys need a hand with that, then please do um, get in touch. Um, before we move on to expectations, in terms of my opinion for Oroquix, um, I don't use it. I think it's actually quite nice to have in the drawer um, as a hygienist. Like if you've got a very small area of pocketing, it might be worth doing. Um, but you know, what is the kind of uh, uh, benefits of using that over LA infiltration? Um, it, it depends. So I think it's one thing, I, I would definitely have it in your drawer if you have that facility, um, but it's useful for very localized um, cases, I think. Okay, so expectations. So it's really important we all know um, how we actually get improvements in pocketing. So it's these three ways how we get improvement. And I mean, look at this radiograph. I don't often take radiographs after treatment, but this is kind of a one-off case just through non-surgical treatment, look at that lower right six. Non-surgical treatment is amazing. For treating periodontitis in my clinic, 90% of the time I will just do non-surgical, right? It works beautifully if it's done well. Look at that. I mean, it's just a completely different tooth, right? So there's, um, I mean, there's the power of non-surgical, I think, I think is amazing. So that's how we get healing. And in terms of average improvements, um, this is what you should know at the back of your mind. For moderate pockets, you usually get about a millimeter of pocket depth improvement. And then the deep pockets, you get seven. And you also get a bit of recession as well. Um, just it's, it's worth keeping those kind of average stats at the back of your mind. So let's now um, go straight into actually doing the treatment. OK, so we've talked about terminology. We've talked about communicating with your patients. So important. In fact, that's why I spent half the webinar on this, because it's just as important as the actual treatment. We've talked about consent. We've talked about what we're expecting. We've talked about planning, um, how we're going to approach this. Do we need LA? Do we need to refer? Do we need to involve a specialist? All these kind of things. Now, your patient, Mrs. Smith, is in the chair, right? Um, uh, and you're going to start treatment. So let me just see if there's any uh, questions. Um, if a patient, so Karen's asking, if we see a patient for the first time and they need referral, do you prefer uh, we refer straight away? Okay, so I think it depends. Um, if they are technically, medically, legally, um, they tick the referral box, i.e. they should be offered a referral. What I would generally say to my hygienists um, that refer into the clinic is say to them, I could, uh, I could refer you at this point, you definitely fit the criteria, but do you want me to give it, give it a go in-house, give, give it one round of treatment, and then if we don't get too much improvement, I'll refer you at that stage, or do you want me to refer you straight away? So give them the option. But for those that say, you know what, I'd rather you do it initially, you've planted the seed, so it's easier for them to accept. Um, and in terms of what you, what you uh, uh, say to them is, and that this is what someone else is asking now, um, is what do you say that the periodontist does that you don't? Just say, well, all the periodontist does is treat very severe gum disease, which you have right now. And currently within my scope of practice, this has gone beyond the point where I can do anything to actually save the teeth. And we're playing with time here. If we leave this too much longer, you will lose your teeth. 
what the periodontist will do, uh, will do is use a, a different level of skill and equipment to um, uh, get improvements. Sometimes they do surgery. Don't say always because they get, they get put off. And to be honest, they don't often do it. So sometimes you will need surgery. Um, but the, the, the good thing is that they'll be able to assess it in detail uh, and give you an idea. We are all going to be working together. So it's not like I'm going to send you off to specialist and never see you again. Once you're healthy, I'll be able to look after you better. So, I mean, that's the kind of way to explain it. Usually in terms of offering private treatment, that's the next question that's so just come up, actually good timing. Um, that's the biggest barrier. Um, most of my patients are like, you know, normal and some of them low income patients. The reason why they accept referral is because we offer interest-free finance. So they can split the payment over a year, year and a half, paying like 60, 70 pound a month. Um, in no more than 100 if they're, you know, over a year or so. It's like a gym membership, right? But you're looking after, your, you're, you're saving your teeth. Um, also, explain to people the cost of not treating. So what is the cost of not treating periodontal disease? So Mrs. Smith, I know you're really worried about the expense, but if you lose that upper right six, I'm sure you already know this, but one implant is about two, three thousand pounds. And do you know, you know, the specialist treatment plan won't go over 2,000, that's for the whole mouth. So your cost of not treating it is far bigger than actually treating it. Um, and finally, work out the cost per tooth. And usually for specialist perio care, it's about 60 pound a tooth. So it's far more affordable than things like Invisalign and, and all those kinds of things. Um, so, uh, but at the end of the day, you can only do what you can do, right? You offer it, you've given them all those options. They say no, fine, put it in your notes and offer it every time. That's all we can do. Um, we, and then you try your best in the appointments that you have, basically. So. Great questions, guys, really good questions. So moving on now to local anesthetic. So I think in my opinion, um, we do need to do it for, for treatment, um, but ask your patient why they're declining. Have they had a bad experience? And from my understanding, most of my patients, if they say, oh, I don't wanna have local, no way am I wanting that injection thing. It's usually because the previous person who did it, they, they gave them a bad experience. So making LA comfortable is really, really important. It's a skill that I think everyone uh, should have. So because firstly, patients will then accept having LA, you'll be able to do more efficient treatment and therefore get better outcomes. And you know, you're gonna get great reviews. I wanna see that hygienist who's really gentle, numbs me up, I didn't feel a thing. I'm sure a lot of you have had that when a patient sits like, excellent, I didn't feel a thing, right? So that's the kind of uh, kind of vibe you want to give off. And if you can do that, you'll build a referral base for like anxious patients. Everyone in the practice will refer to you because you're that hygienist that can make the patient feel comfortable. So that's really, really important. So a couple of tips on this before we move on to instrumentation. So communication. Tell the patient, raise your hand if it's, it's, if it's painful and I will stop straight away. So what happens, say I won't take out the injection, but I will stop. I promise I will pause. So you start giving the LA, patient raises their hand. Oh, sorry, it's, it's really hurting. So, okay, pause. In that time, the local anesthetics is doing its job. Let the hand go down, give the rest of it, and it's not, they're not even gonna feel it because it's already numb. Explain to them that you will feel a sharp scratch. Don't ever say this is not gonna hurt, right? You will lose their trust because it, it will it hurt a little bit initially. Give them some positive reinforcement. Well done, you're doing really well, we're almost done. Count five, four, three, two, one, all those types of things. Distraction. Use a mirror, I always like little, shake the, the dental mirror in the, in the mouth, it distracts them and then inject. Um, for anterior teeth, I get them to bite hard. And whilst they're focusing on the biting, you because it's the most painful areas anteriorly. Music, get them to bring their iPod in or put a mute something on that they like to listen to. In terms of the technique, always use some suction because it's the taste which most of them hate as well. Um, be slow. Slow is, is the key thing. You know, the pain actually isn't from you injecting, it's more so from the pressure buildup. And so if you can be as slow as possible, um, then that's ideal. And injection point is basically what I mean by that is once you've injected, a certain area will numb up. So your next injection point should be in that numbed up zone. Uh, so, and honestly, I, we do this at the clinic and everyone who works at the clinic does the same thing. We start premolar numbed up and then we work back and then we come forward and they only feel the first um, uh, injection point. In terms of equipment, warm your cartridges if you can. You know, we used to use um, like a baby, one of the hygienists um, had like a baby warmer for milk or whatever. So we used to, we used to stick them in there. You don't have to invest in a fancy LA warmer if you don't want to. Um, topical, uh, always use a cotton bud as well. It's, it, it gets to the buccal mucosa a little bit better than if you use a cotton roll. Let the uh, uh, topical actually kick in. 
don't just uh, give it and then just go straight. You need a couple of minutes for it to kick in. Sharp needle, right? Always use a sharp needle um, because if it gets blunt, it's going to hurt. Um, and I use, someone's just asked which type of LA I use, I use Articane. Um, which you can give as infiltrations upper and lower. Don't use it for blocks. We actually don't use blocks at the clinic uh, usually um, because they hurt um, and patients hate them. Their whole face goes numb, their tongue goes numb, their, everything goes numb. Whereas with infalls, it's just literally around uh, around the teeth. So um, it's good to use articane. The reason why you can use that, by the way, is the penetration in the in the bone is much better than things like lignocaine. So you give upper buckle and lower buckle and lingual. Um, so it's worth looking at that. Um, I actually use the wand, which some of you might have. I think it's worth, um, probably not a good time right now because it's co you know, post COVID is gonna be a bit tricky, but it's worth you kind of um, having a look at uh, these kind of systems. We, uh, and the hygienists at the clinic, we only use the wand now and patients absolutely love it. Um, it's honestly, it's just incredible. It's, they hardly feel anything. Um, it's beautiful because their, whole, their, their face doesn't swell up, they, they can move their lips. For some of you who are doing facial aesthetics, by the way, this is a really good thing because the lips will still move. Um, so worth looking into. If you want more info, just, just drop me an email um, after. Okay, before we go into instrumentation, let's just take a couple of these questions. So um, people are asking, um, okay, so you use articane infills for the lower molars too. Yes, I do, buckle and lingual. Um, I don't do palatal uh, anymore using articane LA. Yeah, so because articane is, is so strong, you don't need to give upper palatals because the upper maxillary, the bone is more, um, it's not as dense as the mandible. So the, the actual penetration of the articane will go right the way through. It's just the lower is a little bit more dense. So you've got to go both ways basically. Um, can you give some advice on infiltrating the lower molars? Hard for some patients. Um, yeah, I, I might be able to do something on that later or you can come to the course, which I'll, I'll go through. But it's basically, um, buccally, you're just going where the buccal mucosa is, um, uh, where, the, where the mucogingival junction is basically. And lingually, you're going a few millimeters away from the pocket. Uh, and so, no, yeah, perfect. So I think I've answered the questions um, so far. Okay, so now moving on to instrumentation. Um, oh, sorry, someone's just asked Anna about articane for medical reasons. Yeah, so um, if you can't use articane for medical reasons, then um, you'll need to do a, a block, yeah. Uh, and the medical reason will be like a arrhythmia or some sort of serious heart arrhythmia. That's the only contraindications, hardly any contraindications. All right, so, so thank you, um, Claire, as well, on your point about uh, blocks. Now, before we move on to actually instrumentation, it's all about understanding what we are aiming for. Now, the approach has changed over the years. We used to be super aggressive with everything, but now it's all about biofilm removal, right? We want to remove the biofilm, we want to disturb the biofilm. Um, you also, just to ha have a little picture in your head, you know, super gingival, um, uh, articane is fine for pregnant patients, super gingival calculus and subgingival. It's going to be different, right? Sub is so much harder to, to remove. The reason why I say that is because if you're working super gingivally and you're struggling, you're probably going to think, okay, this is going to be difficult when I go uh, subgingivally. Also, one thing I think I need to highlight is it's not just about biofilm, pla, calculus. It's granulation tissue, that soft, gooey stuff. We also need to remove that as well, otherwise it won't heal as well. So people always ask me, Irina, do I need to do RSD here? Because there's no calculus, can't see anything. Well, firstly, yes, you do need to, because you need to disturb the biofilm, but also you need to get rid of all that scar tissue, granulation tissue. Um, and also at this point, don't forget, try and correct local factors. If there's overhang, speak to the dentist um, and try and use a blended approach. Uh, and my kind of approach, this is a kind of personal to me, um, is uh, airflow, um, uh, ultrasonics, hand scalers, ultrasonics, airflow. So it's a bit of a sandwich kind of blended approach. Um, actually, in terms of what is better than the others, um, ultrasonics and hand scalers are just as effective as each other. Um, so I think it's going to be, um, I don't know what's going to happen post COVID. I, I hope that we can go back and use our ultrasonics um, with appropriate PPE. Um, but if not temporarily, uh, you know, a few weeks of hand scaling is not the end of the world. Um, so let's go on to the first thing that I use, which is airflow. Um, I'll answer the questions in a little while, okay? So um, just bear with me. So we use airflow in the clinic um, to actually uh, dis uh, use it kind of with a GBT uh, protocol. Um, we've kind of adapted the protocol slightly to what we do. Um, this 
photo was kindly taken by Marta, who's one of my hygienists who's listening. Um, so she, uh, the hygienist in the team will, will do this part. So they'll disclose and then they'll do some GBT address um, the biofilm at the beginning of the appointment. Then, so I also use it, say that I then saw the patient for treatment, I also use airflow um, prior to treatment just to get rid of the bulk of the biofilm. And it really helps. I never used to do this. I used to just go straight into ultrasonics and just use airflow at the end for a bit of stain removal. But actually, I mean, this, oh, this is so satisfying, right? I'm sure you're all thinking, oh my God, I want to go to work. Um, but it's great to, you know, patients with a lot of plaque, it, it removes the majority of it and you can actually see the calculus better. So it's great um, at that point as well. And then it's nice to also use at the end of treatment um, just for any kind of stain uh, removal as well. Um, so I think airflow, if you have it, definitely, if you want to find out more about it, but again, just email me and I can connect you with the appropriate people. Um, but we generally use the airflow plus powder, um, which uh, has uh, erythritol in it uh, and you can use it everywhere. Um, so, uh, and someone's asking about nurses. I think you do need a nurse for things like this. We do have nurse assistants at our clinic. Um, hopefully all of you will have, especially post COVID, it's, it's going to be needed. Um, so yeah, it, it does. I don't think it's impossible to use it without a nurse, but it's great if you can have some assistance so the patient doesn't get water and powder all over them, um, then uh, the Airflow Plus is the powder to use. So ultrasonics, common problems with these now are worn down inserts. I'm sure you can all um, uh, kind of relate to this is worn down ultrasonics are a common problem. Um, so we need to be aware of this. Unfortunately, even if you have two millimeters of wear, right? Like even just two millimeters, which is hardly anything. Some of you might even not notice the difference. Look at the difference it makes. 30% uh, increase in treatment time, you're spending longer to get that calculus off, and you're, put, you're putting more pressure. So it's really important that whichever system you're using, you order a wear guide. Um, so you know objectively, what are my tips like? What are my inserts like? So what you do is you basically put it against the wear guide, um, and then you, uh, where it gets to the red line, red is dead. So if it's dead, you need to replace it. So it's kind of a good audit uh, to set up. Um, so that's a, it's a good thing to do uh, in practice to make sure you've got good quality um, instruments. Just to give you a bit of background on ultrasonics, there are two different types, which I'm sure you already know. There are magnetostrictive or piezoelectric, and they work in different ways. So the piezoelectric, how that works, and this is like um, the EMS system, or there's piezo, the electrical energy activates the ceramic crystals in the handpiece, and that creates the motion you need. Whereas with magnetostrictive, which is like the Cavitron system, the electrical energy is applied to the metal strips. Um, and you can see this is what it looks like inside the insert. You've got this metal coil and that creates a magnetic um, field um, and it causes the, the insert to elongate and um, come back and that causes vibration. So um, this is the, the other system. So let's have a look. Um, at the moment, I'm using a Cavitron. Um, I'm going to give EMS, I use the EMS Airflow, but currently I don't use the um, Piso, but I'm going to give it a go because I've had some good reviews about it as well. So currently we're using uh, Magda, but I think they're just as good as each other um, uh, at the moment. Let's see if there's any questions. Um, okay, fine. Okay, so um, when you're actually treating the mechanism of action, there's four things you need to be aware of. There's mechanical, which is obvious, you're mechanically um, removing it. You have the irrigation, right, from the water. Again, that's obvious. Um, but also, don't forget about the cavitation. You have these little bubbles. This is a high kind of res image of what's going on the end of your tip. The bubbles are imploding, and that causes the bacteria to die as well. So there's that element of it. There's also the element of acoustic microstreaming. So that's why all of us are like, I really want to use the ultrasonic when we go back, because it does a lot uh, in terms of mechanism of action. It's not just the mechanical removal. Um, and this is interesting because you can see the bacteria before and after using ultrasonics. In terms of technique, um, it's important to use the appropriate technique, which we'll go through in a minute. Um, but also uh, instrument selection is key. There are, you know, like dentists have when they're doing a restoration, they'll have a tray of instruments. They'll have, you know, flat pack. I, I haven't done a restoration for like over probably 10 years now, but they'll have um, you know, lots of instruments they use to um, do a restoration. In the same way, I think it's important as hygienist therapists and periodontists, we have a range of instruments we can use because it's a not, uh, you know, usually it's not just one that, that will fit all. But my favorite from the, uh, the system I'm currently using is the green one. Um, 
but there are different types of, of systems. So with the uh, ultrasonics, you actually get a left and right, which is quite nice to use, especially for vacations areas. Um, so get to know whichever um, kind of brand you're using, get to know the types of options there are available for you. Um, and maybe, you know, you might not have the luxury to have 10 instruments, maybe even two might make a big, big difference. All right. So in terms of the um, technique, um, it's a very, very uh, thin kind of small two millimeter increment um, movement. And when I do uh, the, uh, my course, and often I do this for dentists as well, I get them to use a candle and then, um, you know, the wax, the white part of the candle, the wax of the candle, I get them to just take that white bit off. And that gives you really a good idea as to what your technique should be like. I've also got these, um, if you guys are bored, just let me know, I can send you these. They're coloring in sheets. Um, and uh, basically you get a pencil and then where you've got these little squares, um, you just uh, color in each square with a pencil. And again, that replicates a technique um, that you should use. So in terms of grasp, it's a light grasp. The lighter your grasp, the better your tactile sensation. It's gotta be feather-like, that's what they say. Um, it's always the, the uh, last two to four millimeters, which will be the most effective. Okay, and that needs to be right up against the tooth surface, right up against it. So you're getting the maximum amount of effectiveness. Now, here also, just to say, if you're using um, the piezo, it's only the lateral sides that will be effective, whereas if you're using Cavitron, that all of the surfaces will be effective. So the technique for both systems is slightly different. Um, but either way, short overlapping strokes, right? So like erasing motions, you can go obliquely, you can go vertically, you've got to activate your tip before inserting it into the pocket, right? So you go from coronal to apical, you can use a tapping motion for if you've got chunks of calculus, you shouldn't use a tapping motion though on, um, on teeth, it can damage them. Um, and in terms of furcations, you've got to really tuck that ultrasonic right into uh, the furcation. So this is just a little video. I thought I'd include some videos because I think we're all missing um, work a lot. So this is back to our patient, uh, Mr. Zeng, um, who we saw recently actually. So uh, when you're using the ultrasonics, it's just kind of, it's not a very uh, good video, but small movements go right down into the pocket, uh, just use a variety of strokes. I think ultrasonics are easier to understand how to use rather than um, hand scalers. Still being gentle, not being over aggressive, but being being nice and uh, gentle with it. Um, just looking at the questions, Ken, I don't use a microscope, but I use loops. Um, my hygienists use 2.5, I use four, but that's usually just for surgery. Um, yeah, the plastic instruments for ultra um, for uh, um, implants. I don't use them. They don't, I agree, they don't work as well. It's actually, sometimes it makes things worse. So um, I would just use normal instruments. Uh, I don't have a preference, I would say, at the moment for piezo or cavitron. I'm waiting to try out the piezo, so I'll let you know. Um, okay, so um, in terms of settings, keep your power fairly low. Don't whack it up right to the top. Only increase it as you need it. Um, because when you're working with really thin tips, you don't want to have a really high setting. Um, uh, you, you don't need one either. Um, lots of water, right? Water is our friend. So lots and lots of water um, and lavage. And watch out for overheating. Overheating can be caused by a number of things. Um, sometimes, remember, by the way, I didn't know this, right? Till when was it? Like a few years ago, I went on a um, ultrasonic uh, course. And four days, I was like, oh my God, am I going to learn in four days about ultrasonics? It was fantastic. And um, uh, basically, they, uh, they were saying before you insert the insert, you're meant to fill up, right, the black bit with water, twist the instrument round so the, um, the rubber bit gets uh, lubricated, and then insert it. Simple things like that will, uh, will stop you from overheating. But obviously, when the, the stacks look like this, it needs to be uh, changed. Sometimes, the little water port can get blocked. So you can use like a little endo file to unblock that. It's really interesting to see um, the comments on Piso actually. I'm looking forward to trying it out now properly. Um, it, a lot of people are saying a lot of good things about it. I have to say, I don't yet have a, when I know what my favorite is, I'll let you guys know. Um, at the moment, I've, I've been trained on um, Cavitron, but we are going to be getting a, a joint system and we're gonna have both on the clinic so we can try out what we like. And then I guess it'll be good to hear what, what you guys think as well. Um, okay, great. So, uh, and finally, by the way, I thought I'd just include um, the pacemaker thing because everyone always asks about this. In terms of new pacemakers, you'd probably be okay to use it, but I wouldn't take the risk. 
you need to get clearance from the cardiologist if you really want to use it on a pacemaker. Um, I had a hygienist uh, I used to work with and um, unfortunately um, the patient had a pacemaker and they used the ultrasonic and then on her way down to the, the um, there's some stairs to get to the to reception, um, she basically collapsed. And I mean, it could have been anything, right? Because she had heart issues and so on. But the, the point of the matter was that an ultrasonic was used on a pacemaker. So what happens then? So I'm very, with things like medical stuff, I'm very risk averse. So um, it's up to you, but um, yeah, I would just be a little bit careful with that. Okay, so Chris prefers Cavitron. Okay, I think it's a mix, it's a mixed bag um, on that. It'd be interesting. I should have done a poll on that actually. Maybe next time. Okay, on to hand instrumentation. This is gonna be quite important when we go back. Like worn down ultrasonics, right? We've got to use um, nice and sharp instruments. Blunt instruments um, are a, a problem. So always use sharp instruments. You either have to sharpen your instruments uh, and you can do a practice audit to ensure that's being done, or you can actually explore sharpening services. Or like us at the clinic, we do not use sharpening. We don't use instruments that need sharpening. I actually think we've got so much already to do on the clinic. Like you're already having to uh, prepare everything and get the patient in and communicate and do this and OHI in the 30 minute appointment. To then have to, before the appointment, sharpen your instruments is another thing that sometimes we don't have time for. And often sharpening them is actually quite difficult. And if you get it wrong, you can really uh, mess up the blade on the instrument. So this is where I decided I wanted to use non-sharpening instruments. And it's, it's like the best thing ever. Like, um, so I'm not even just saying this, it's, I mean, it speaks to anyone who uses is American Eagle, I'll tell you about these, them in a minute. Um, but yeah, it's, if not, if you've got a set, a set of instruments anyway, think about how you might wanna sharpen them. There are things you can get to help your sharpening. Like you can get specific stones that will hold it in a certain place. Um, but you know, I'm kind of a bit lazy, so I like to have them already sharp. So in terms of, um, Let's go into technique now, because I think this is quite uh, important. Know you, what you're working with, know your instrument. We've understood the biology of the patient. Now we need to know what we're working with. So there are parts of the instrument. There's your blade, your terminal shank, and your upper shank. Your terminal shank is the key one to know, because that's going to come uh, into importance when we actually um, talk about technique. But when you pick up an instrument, right, sometimes some of you might even be locuming. You might not have a choice as to which uh, instruments you have. But you need to know when you pick up an instrument, what is it used for? Is it anterior? Is it posterior? Is it mesial? Is it um, other two working surfaces? So there are four steps that I would recommend. Firstly, you look at the tip of the blade, right? Sorry, firstly, you look at the angulation of the shank. Is it straight or is it curved? If it's straight, you're anterior. If it's curved, it needs a bit of a bend to get at the back, so it's posterior. That's the first step. The second step is the tip of the blade, right? If it's sharp, it's supra. If it's blunt, it's sub, right? Um, number of uh, sharp edges. It can either be one sharp edge, so you use that edge on the tooth, or it can be universal. And you'll see the difference in the, the shininess. So have a look at that. Then look at the size of the blade. Now the American Eagles um, uh, have mini blades as well, which is another reason why I like them because you can get them into tight interproximal spaces, you can get them into furcations areas. Um, and so look at that as well. So there's four steps and there's various terminologies that you can use. Again, I mean, personally, I just call them hand instruments, but if you want to be nitty picky on this, this is what, uh, what you follow essentially. Um, also um, in terms of technique, I think we sometimes think it's easy to use hand instruments and um, some of us qualified a long time ago, some of us qualified a few years ago, um, but personally, and I, I teach at the, the hospital, sometimes not enough time is actually given to teaching actual technique, both on ultrasonics and handscapes. At least when we, when I do my course, a lot of the hygienists will say, actually, you know what? I, I'm not that confident with it. And we do this every day. So we need to be confident with what we're doing. So we need to be methodical. We need to make sure the tip, the blade, should always be pointed interdentally. Don't point it on the like buckle, mid buckle surface, always interdentally. The terminal shank, remember that bit in the middle, needs to be parallel to your root surface. That's where you get your optimum blade angle. Finger rest always. You don't want to be that person who slips and goes into the buccal mucosa, right? Really firm finger rest, push down to the end of the pocket, right down, right? And then scrape right up to the root surface. Um, and uh, I mean, this is, honestly, it's, it's just practice, but you do need to apply quite a lot of pressure. 
um, to, to some people are a little bit more gentle than others, but the way we work at the clinic, we're very gentle with the ultrasonics with the hands because we've, it's controlled force, but we put a fair amount of force on. Um, you don't need to take the instrument out um, every single time. You can do lots of little strokes and then take it out. If you do have assistance, that's great. Then you can have a, someone with a suction tip, like a thin endosuction tip uh, that you can use to um, suction or a cotton roll on your other hand. Um, but imagine it's a blind procedure, right? It's a bit like when dentists do endo. They, they, can't, they don't know what that canal looks like. You don't know what's in that pocket. Think about anatomy. Imagine you're going down, is there a groove? Is it an upper four where there might be a groove? Is there something anatomically like a furcation that I need to be aware of? So this is an image of the terminal shank being parallel to your root surface. Um, and then going back to our patient, um, Mr. Zeng, <laughs> this is like so satisfying. Um, you see the granulation tissue coming out and everything. So he, I need to see him still for a reassessment. I only saw him recently. I literally can't wait to see what he looks like. Hopefully we can all go back to work soon. Um, and there's two instruments with the I use the American Eagle system. I always have actually. Um, and there's two instruments that you get, which is a, which is kind of initially all you need. And this is technically what I use most of the time. There's an anterior one, which you can see is more straight. And then there's a posterior one, which is more angled. I'll just show you the posterior one here. Can see that that kind of gooey stuff so i always get asked what's granulation tissue it's like the soft gooey stuff that comes out that's uh, uh granulation tissue so satisfying all right so i use the american eagle um everyone who knows me uh knows that i would never promote anything that i don't believe in and i asked to organize i organized this webinar i just said it to american eagle if they want to jump on board because i love your instruments so it's not like a you know i'm saying something which i don't believe in and everyone in the chat is also agreeing they are amazing they're high quality simple it's all about simplicity as a hygienist and therapist even as a periodontist you can get away with two instruments and you can get you don't have to even sharpen them um you know it, it gives you some great results the reason why i'd have to sharpen them they've got this xp technology which allows the the actual um material to not get blunt so easily and what happens after a few years um it depends how often you work right um this is fifteen thousand strokes depends if you're seeing 10 patients a day how often you're working i have to say i've had mine for a little while i'm going to renew them when i get back but they're still working really well um and there's two instruments and basically what i've done i've managed to Jason is very kind. Um, I've tried to, for you, only for you guys on the webinar, by the way, so please don't share this with anyone who, uh, well, you can, um, but it's really meant for you guys. Um, there's a special offer for both of them, including VAT, is 105 pounds, and that's open. I think you guys that are in Australia and Japan, I'm sure we can organize something as well to get them shipped to you. Um, what I'm gonna do, and they're the only two you need, you are going to love them. Just get one set, try them out, and then get another if you want. Um, I'm going to send you an email, by the way, after this, which will have a special link for you. And also it's COVID. You might think, oh my God, I don't want to spend any money. That's totally fine. So what you do is you just register your interest. And when things settle down, Jason will get in touch and then you can order, right? So it's a special thing that we've done that you're not going to be, uh, if, you, if you can, to be honest, if you can get it now, it's great. But if not, you can, we can get in touch with you when it's at the, the right time. I just want to do a little poll now. Um, I've got another 15, 20 minutes to go, but let's just launch the first poll. So you get a little question, let's just make this a little bit fun, that comes up onto your screen. If you can vote when choosing hand instruments, do you factor in the cost of sharpening? Brilliant. And whilst you're doing that, um, Lucas, just on your question, um, on that one, sometimes they need surgery. If it's distal of the seven, you, you sometimes need uh, surgery. All right, great. Moving on now. Okay, just just bear with me. We'll be done by probably 20 past rather than quarter past. I'll give you the right amount of CPD, don't worry. Um, so moving on to dental implants. Someone asked about this earlier. Um, another poll, okay. How confident do you feel um, with assessing and dealing with dental implants? Just as it's good for us to know as well, and I can kind of tailor education accordingly as well. Assessing and dealing with, like someone came in with an implant, you'd be like, yeah, I know what to do, or I'm happy to probe it and all those kind of things. So 
someone saying a refer, probably a good idea, especially if you've got those issues around it. Okay, good, thank you for that, guys. Okay, so with um, dental implants, just I want to go over this because I know a lot of people ask about it. If you've got peri-implant health, all you've got to do is reinforce oral hygiene. You've still got to do that because actually cleaning around implants is very difficult. Um, so you do need to get that single tufted there. You do need to show them in the mouth. Um, if they've got peri-implant mucositis, i.e. there's a bit of bleeding, the Airflow Plus is great here, um, or just normal Profi polish, just go over OHI. If you see calculus, you can remove it with an ultrasonic, a normal ultrasonic tip, which are the ones we spoke about. Um, but if you're not confident, and definitely, which someone's already said, if you've got peri-implantitis, I would just refer that. I wouldn't even attempt treatment. I would refer that straight away. Unfortunately, so I do see quite a lot of peri-implantitis on the clinic. And annoyingly, it's really difficult to treat. We've had some great results, but it's unpredictable. Um, we usually have to do surgery where we raise the flap, disinfect it. It doesn't look nice after, but so don't give your patient any false hope. Just say what we're trying to do is um, trying to slow down the progression. There is an issue here, Mr. Smith, I'm really sorry, but let's try and give it a bit more life. Let's slow down the progression. Hopefully the periodontist will be able to help you with this. It's very, very, uh, it's a time bomb that's probably already gone off in terms of periodontitis. So we are almost um, there. Let's just quickly have a look at some questions. Uh, water pick for implants. I just prefer the um, single tufted. My advice on devices like water pick, airflow, air floss, all that kind of stuff is it just removes debris, doesn't remove um, plaque. And I would just say to the patient, look, you can use it if you want to. Some of them I know come in, they're so excited. I have so many patients who come in, especially when they see the hygienist, they're like, I've just bought this, you know, um, and I just can't wait to use it. The last thing you want to do is say, Miss Smith, you wasted your money because they'll get really upset and they get demotivated. So say that's great, you can use that, but don't forget it's not a replacement, right? It's an adjunct, it's a bit like if you had a dirty dish, okay? It's just rinsing the dish. You wanna actually scrub it, get everything off, get all the grub off, and that's where the interdental brushes um, come into play. Um, and someone's asking, do you refer straight away um, in the first instance? Uh, for, if it's a, what you can do with implants, refer it to the person who placed it, if you can. If, they, if sometimes it's not possible, then refer it to a periodontist. Um, and again, I'm, uh, even if you want me to just have a look at cases, like um, just email me. Um, in terms of plastic tips from Cavitron, I, I don't use them. Um, I prefer the uh, metal ones. And that's just my, because I also treat perimplantitis. And then when I use them around the implant thread, they break up and you get little bits of plastic. It's just uh, not fun. Um, uh, it's not fun to use. So um, last little bit before we finish, another little poll, okay? Backache, RSI. Can you let me know, have you ever suffered from RSI or um, back pain. I'll let you know these results because this is really interesting. I definitely have. Um, whilst we're on that, just a couple of questions on um, differentiating between peri-implantitis and peri mucositis. Mucositis is just bleeding. Implantitis is when you've got um, uh, bone loss, uh, doo -doo -doo -doo, a lot of neck pain. Oh, yeah, I should have included that. Thanks, everyone. Neck pain also is, I guess, part of, it's not really back pain, but yeah, shoulder pain, the whole, basically the whole of our body. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's, it's not good. So, um, what I just wanted to include, um, and let's just, I'll just tell you the, the stats actually, which is still going up, 89% um, have had back pain. God, that's huge. 58% uh, have actually had RSI. That's more than I expected actually, very interesting. Okay, um, so in terms of RSI, now this um, looks really funny, but it's really important to rest your hands, even between picking up those instruments. When people come and observe me, when they come in the mentoring program for the hygienist course, they'll see me doing this with my hands and initially like, what is she doing? But it makes a big difference. Even when you're just in between, like um, each instrument, just kind of do that, um, build the strength. <laughs> These I ordered them from Amazon. I know they look a bit stupid, but actually I, the idea I got from this is when I went for a course on surgery and the guy who was teaching, I said, you know, stability and strength in your fingers is really important for our job. So he does all these like hand and finger exercises every morning. And I thought, this is just, you know, just some random thing. But then I started doing it and 
I didn't, I don't, my hands uh, don't shake, even if I had coffee, I just feel like my, my hands are stronger, my fingers are stronger, so um, I'd get uh, less problems with RSI. So, you know, you can buy these little like gadgets, five pounds, six pounds on, on, on Amazon. Um, think about posture when you're sitting. I know it's really hard sometimes with the work we do, but always get that tripod position. Look at where your chair is, look at where the patient's head is. Um, think about your positioning when you're working. And again, you know, if you're working alone, this can be a little bit difficult, um, but try to keep your back as, as straight as possible. I think we have to look after ourselves. Um, otherwise, what happens is um, we end up, uh, we want to have a long career and we don't want to cut it short. This is my patient. I wasn't going to put this in, it's slightly embarrassing, but um, I actually find it so useful. This is Kerry. She's, uh, she was referred by Dorota, which is one of the hygienists um, that I uh, work with. And she's a yoga tutor as well. Uh, her pair is all good now. Um, so she helped me with exercises for hygienists. And um, as part of the course, we do like quite a lot of fun stuff as well. And um, we did this uh, uh, kind of, yeah, cat cow, all of that. Um, and also the other one, which was quite interesting um, was, uh, Sorry, the other one which was interesting was um, even this one I didn't know about. So eye yoga, like you rub your hand. You know, sounds like I get eye strain all the time. I don't know why, but you do this and then you literally just cover your eyes. It actually works really well. Um, so that's another thing you can do. And then also as you're on the floor with your hands, you can actually move around that your wrist. I found that really helps as well with your wrists as well. So um, get into routine with that. You know, some of these things we can even do <laughs> in the surgery, but the key thing is, um, look after yourself because that's important you can't you don't look after yourself you can't look after um anyone else so to conclude actually i'm on time that's good so we're on time um to conclude communication is key um with your patients we've gone through the whole of the treatment journey you need to plan your treatment from the outset don't just jump in and think oh i'm doing RS, RS, rsd think about what you're doing why you're doing it think about the science um give LA but give it comfortably as, as comfortably as you can think about your instrumentation you know it's easy when we've got back-to-back -back day or 30 minutes appointments and you just you switch off you don't think about what you're doing right sometimes so keep engaged what am I doing have I removed everything have I can I feel any uh, um, rough de deposits what kind of patient am I looking at do I need to check the x-rays before I do the the treatment think about posture think about positioning think about uh, actually e exercising as well um, and again now is the time uh, to do it so um, we've got a couple of minutes. Uh, if there are any final questions, pop them in the chat. But um, some of you have already signed up to my email series. So it's, if you just take a screenshot of this um, uh, page, uh, just type that into a browser and you'll get daily emails um, for a few weeks on uh, Perio, which hopefully you'll find useful. Um, a lot of you are asking about the courses as well. Um, uh, if you're in London, then um, please get in touch. If you're not in London, I've actually, because I had a lot of people asking about online courses. So I'm almost finished working on that. So either way, if you go to the hygienistcourse.com, you can register your interest for either. And then at least I've got your contact details and I can get in touch. Um, now I think about 150 people have now gone through the course. Like we've got a really nice community and it'll be great to, even for people all over the world, maybe we can create like an online community as well. It'll be super fun. Um, as part of the hygienist course, um, I also do a mentoring program. It's part of the course where you can actually come onto the clinic. Uh, two hygienists come and we work kind of together. We see patients together. And I think that is a great way to learn as well. It's 12 sessions. It's quite a long time, but you, people, a lot of them in the group at the moment, you'll see how much difference it makes um, and it's really fun as well and I pay you for that as well too because um, you're helping me I, I also pay you for your mentoring program I'll give you a grant uh, for it so anyway if you want to um, find out more just uh, get in touch with the hygienistcourse.com and just drop me your details a little bit of um, uh, admin before we uh, finish up so for those in Australia that are asking um, I'm going to do an online one for sure so please just drop me your details in there and then um, uh, I'll let you know okay this is a key thing, right? You're going to get a feedback form um, either when you finish the webinar or I will email it to you, um, but or both. And please, can you fill in the feedback form by Sunday evening? Because after that, on Monday, you'll get your CPD certificate. You won't get your CPD certificate immediately. So don't email and say, oh, I've got my CPD So Just wait. And then I'm going to send them out in one bunch uh, on Monday evening. Okay, if after Monday evening, or if you don't get the feedback form um, before um, the end of today, please just drop me an email on info at rwperio.com. Um, so 
Any further questions before we finish? Thank you so much, uh, everyone, for being so informative. Uh, such a fantastic group. We've got uh, almost 600 people here today. Um, I really hope you found it helpful, um, and I do hope we can keep in touch. Please give me some feedback if you're up for more sessions whilst we're in COVID mode, and tell me what you want to learn about. Um, I'm happy to kind of organize it from my point of view. Uh, thank you to Jason as well for all his help with organizing this um, and hopefully you guys will be getting some American Eagles. I cannot recommend it enough. Um, so just some final questions. Um, whoops, lots of messages coming in. Um, just some fun. That's my email by the way. You can email me at any point. Uh, how do you cope with strong tongue and strong lips <laughs> and working without an earth? It's difficult, I think, really difficult, especially if you're working alone. Um, I think good retraction is important. Um, sometimes you can use a, a nice thick suction tip to move the uh, tongue out of the way. I think Cabotron do a suction tip where they've got a mirror as well as their suction tip, um, which is quite handy as well. Our job is not easy. Um, so I think we can do the best we can. Um, so thank you very much. Um, this is my email address. If you have any questions, it's questions at rwpera.com. Um, and that's my Instagram. You can, if you want to, you can take a little picture, tag us. Um, I do quite a lot of educational stuff on the Instagram page as well. So it might be helpful for you to follow that as well. Um, great. Uh, yes, I definitely use loops. Uh, and the hygienists in our team use loops all the time for everything. Optrogate is good for um, airflow. Definitely agree. And actually just general treatment, especially if you're working alone. Uh, chlorhexidine, I do not advise. Okay. There's no need to irrigate the pockets or anything like that. Um, it doesn't have any effect. The, the, the GCF, the fluid in the pocket, turns over like very, very quickly. So the chlorhexidine doesn't have any effect. The only time I, I, I get patients to use, they call it cordicil, right? Not corsidil. They, they, I tell them to use cordicil um, when uh, I've done surgery. We don't use it any other time. Sometimes with really bad breath, we use it, but hardly ever. Um, I don't know what's going to happen post COVID. Um, I just pray that we can still use what we're using if with appropriate PPE. Um, things will get better. Um, azithromycin, people are asking about, I do use that as an antibiotic, um, but very, very severe cases. Um, perio chip, um, we do not use. It, the, the, uh, the evidence base for local um, antibiotics um, or antimicrobials, which perio chip is, hardly anything. It's not justified. Um, might be statistically significant, but it's not clinically significant. Um, Loops brands, I recommend Oroscoptic. Um, if you want to, again, drop me an email, I can get you in touch with Please but don't buy anything until you've spoken to me. I can probably get you some discounts. Um, so just, just get in touch with me. They've got really nice hygiene loops, the, the oroscopic ones. Uh, medications, I mean, you know, uh, ibuprofen after treatment if you need to, if they're not asthmatic. Um, but other than that, not, not really. All right, guys, we could go on, but I want to make sure I finish on time. So thank you so much for your time. Keep in touch, stay safe. Um, and hopefully we can pray we can get back to work as soon as possible and get back to, to what we've been doing. Stay positive, guys, and thank you so much for your attention today and all your engagement and involvement. Uh, it's, it's really made it easy for me. Thank you so much. You will get an email with all the information. If you do not get my email, by the end of the day, please email info at rwpera.com or questions at rwpera.com. I will give you all the information. Um, so uh, have a good day for those of you in the UK and good night uh, to all of you there, uh, abroad, especially those in Australia. Thank you.